Good evening, everyone. And if you're kind of joining us from anywhere around the world, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us again for a wonderful nutrition webinar. I'm Amy Leitman. I'm your host and moderator for this evening. I'm the president of NTM Info Research. And it's my pleasure to welcome you back for another great webinar in our nutrition webinar series. Today's topic is healthy foods, healthy planets with our speaker, Michelle McDonald, our registered dietitian, Many of you already know Michelle's background, but for those of you who don't, Michelle is a registered dietitian at National Jewish Health, and she has a, an extensive background working with patients in multiple areas, including diabetes, COPD, and other lung diseases, and uh, gastrointestinal disease, interstitial lung disease, and rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, and other areas. She provides compassionate, comprehensive nutritional care to adult patients with various chronic conditions. She works closely with multidisciplinary teams of specialty clinics, counseling both inpatients and outpatients, and is dedicated to helping patients use nutrition as a supportive therapy to manage disease and optimize health. Michelle completed a Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition at Cornell University, a Master of Science in Food Science and Human Nutrition at Colorado State University, and a dietetic internship at the University of Northern Colorado. Welcome, Michelle. Today, you'll be able to drop questions into the Q&A section. You'll find that at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you type your question into that box and you hit send. And at the end of the presentation, I will be asking the questions for Michelle to answer. We'd like to thank InsMed for their generous support of our programming. Without their support and the support of people like you, we could not continue to bring this wonderful programming. And it's our pleasure to do so. So thank you very much. Don't forget to find us on social media. You can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And you can also find us on YouTube where you can follow all of our latest webinars and catch up on the past ones. You can also sign up for the latest news at ntminfo.org and keep up with our latest programming as well. Michelle, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you back. We're very excited to hear about today's topic. Thanks, Amy. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And I should say thank you for everyone who's joining. I realize it's a weekday. It's a weekday for me too. I'm coming back from, from Denver and joining. And it's my pleasure to be here. Honestly, this is a good topic and it's rel a relatively new topic for me. So um, this was fun to read about. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead. Find my screen. Okay, here we are. So again, welcome. And what I'll say is that um, I have to offer a disclaimer in terms of sustainable diets or, or healthy food to help for a healthy plan. An area of expertise for me, but it's certainly a, an area of interest and one that I would like to know more about. So in terms of an overview, I usually like to look big picture. I started with what exactly is diet's role in planetary health. And I based this particular presentation on uh, a video by the Gaples Institute, which is a physician-led nonprofit that is dedicated to healthy food and um, sustainable diets, so healthy food, healthy planet. And we'll actually take a, take a look at that. They created a video that I would like to share. They want it to be shared, and I, I thought it was a good starting point. That particular institute and that video led me to um, an article in the Lancet that was authored by Dr. Walter Willett, um, as well as I think there were, there may have been 37 uh, scientists or experts in, in their respective um, interdisciplinary fields that contributed. Um, but it's the information from this talk does come from that article. And I'll explain more as we go, but essentially the article is dedicated to understanding how we can create healthy food systems to create both healthy food and a healthy planet. And then, uh, so we'll, we'll start really with those two things. And then I just ended with a basic meal brainstorm in terms of 
how to apply some of these things. I will also, um, as I go through the video, because the video is interactive, I'll also stop and try and address how some of these things could be uh, applied to people with NTM lung disease and bronchiectasis, because um, as I became aware, and I think as I was aware, a lot of my recommendations aren't necessarily in line with um, diets that are also considered sustainable. So there, there has to be some reconciliation. Okay, so we'll get started. So we're gonna look really, uh, number one, at the connection between diet and planet health. And something that I found uh, pretty stunning was that our food systems, in particular, our, particularly our food production, according to the Lancet article, is, they suggest, the largest cause of global environmental change. And so there are a number of factors that demonstrate this. I put climate change as number one, because it is truly, you could argue that it is um, something that's causing our, the human race. It's like an, it poses an existential threat to the human race. And so I thought this was stunning. Supposedly our food production systems are responsible for up to 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And greenhouse gases, as a reminder, are carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide. Water vapor is also in there, but these are the ones that you hear about being emitted. Um, so 30% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. So as I was thinking about this topic, I was like, well, how much impact could, could diet possibly have? What, what percentage are we talking? And I was struck by 30%. I think that's significant. And it makes me think that, you know, me personally, me individually, populations of people, um, if by choosing how they eat, if they can have an effect on this number, then that's significant. So just some qualifiers. So if our food production system is responsible for up to 30% of greenhouse gas emissions, why does that matter? Well, in very basic terms, greenhouse gases, the ones I've listed above, can trap heat in our Earth's atmosphere and cause global warming. Global warming is what is thought by scientists to contribute to more intense drought, extreme heat and wildfires, flooding. And I think I certainly living in Colorado, I, um, I feel like I'm experiencing this firsthand. Maybe you can relate, but wildfires are common and air quality is poor. But additionally, we can see food shortages and a decline of species, including the mass die off of the world's coral reefs. So there's a direct link here between how we produce our food and um, how it affects climate change. And I'm gonna expand on this because it's an important point. So just again, to put this a little bit into context, since the start of the industrial revolution, which I think is estimated to be between 1750 and 1850, more than 2000 billion tons of carbon dioxide one of the primary greenhouse gases have been released into the atmosphere by human activities. My resource is the Natural Resource Defense Council. I've listed it below. North America and Europe are responsible for about 50% of that large amount of carbon dioxide that's been put into the atmosphere. China and India come next with about 14%, and then 150 plus other countries contribute the remainder. But you can see that. Uh, the, the Western world is contributing a large amount. Today, China is, is number one in terms of being the biggest emitter at 27% uh, per of all global emissions. The US comes second um, in terms of contributing about 15% of greenhouse gases. The European Union is next and India is next. So the US plays the second biggest role in the world towards greenhouse gas emissions. And of our role, um, food production may contribute up to 30% of all of our greenhouse gas emissions. So again, I find that, um, I find that significant and um, eye-opening. Additionally, there is this um, observation and fact that over the for the past 800,000 years, which is longer than human civilization has existed, 
The concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth's atmosphere is between 200 and 280 parts per million. Um, so, and then recently in the past century, that concentration has jumped to over 400 parts per million. And it's believed to be driven by human activities like burning of fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas, as well as deforestation. So we're adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. At the same time, we're removing our ability um, to remove it from the atmosphere with plants and forests. Again, the reference is the Natural Resources Defense Council. And this is just in a picture representation in terms of uh, carbon dioxide levels. And this is just one of the greenhouse gases, but it, it's what we believe to be dangerously high now. Source for this is the National, National Oceanic Atmospheric Association. Okay, so that's number one. So our food, what we eat and how we produce it contributes significantly to climate change. Other ways that it affects global environmental change in terms of our food and what we eat is that there is a, a measurable biodiversity loss. So how does this happen? Primarily through converting natural ecosystems, um, forests, particularly in tropical areas of the world, to agricultural cropland and pastures. That is the largest factor causing species to be threatened with extinction. Additionally, I had to add in there that monoculture farming, which is growing only one, one type, that should say type of crop at one time on a specific field also decreases diversity. So again, what we're eating and how our food systems um, promote what we eat and how we eat can affect biodiversity on the planet. Additionally, it affects global environmental change by affecting how our land and how our water systems are changing. So food production is responsible for 40% of all land worldwide, that's typically agriculture, and responsible for 70% of freshwater use. And in terms of, uh, I mean, I'm certainly familiar with water shortages here. Um, particularly because we're having drought in the, the West Southwest. But again, what we eat directly affects how we're experiencing not only the climate, um, but the species and the biodiversity of our ecosystem and how our, what land is available, how it's being used as well as water use and availability. We also have, um, because of the food production system, quite a bit of nitrogen and phosphorus misuse and overuse, and particularly in the form of fertilizers. So what this can cause is what's called eutrophication. It's a, an excess richness of nutrients in a body of water that's frequently due to the runoff from the land um, because of the application of these um, uh, minerals. And then this causes a dense growth of plant life in the body of water and then a, a at the same time, a death of animal life from lack of oxygen. So you end up with these dead zones in coastal areas and lakes. It's essentially pollution of our water systems. And there's also chemical pollution in terms of the application of herbicides and pesticides. The Lancet article actually doesn't go into great detail in terms of chemical pollution, but it is also a factor. So all of these things, and this is in summary, um, our diet and our food production systems that are are supporting our diet affect climate change, biodiversity loss, our land and our water, um, as well as um, our nitrogen and phosphorus kind of pollutants and other pollutants that might be entered into our global system because of how we produce food and ultimately what, what we're eating. So that is probably the, the downside or the, the heavy side of all this. The Lancet article goes on to say that um, what they envision are food systems that can support both human health and environmental sustainability. And so I found the article to be hopeful because um, it was published in 2019 and I imagine the work leading up to it was significant prior to, but um, what they are doing is they're stating some goals and some pathways to achieve um, healthy food production that is also sustainable. And they're doing it with the goal to both meet <clears throat> Paris, the Paris Accord or the Paris Climate Change Accord 
uh, to try and meet the goals of that agreement, as well as to support a population of 10 billion people by they estimate about uh, 2050. So they suggest that if we're able to transform our food systems, um, which includes changing how we eat, that we, sh we can, we have the potential to provide healthy food for 10 billion people in the world in a sustainable fashion. And so what they're saying is, look, we're, the, we're not doing right, or the status quo is, is not taking us where we wanna go, but there is the potential. So in terms of greenhouse gas reduction, what they focus on is diets that will reduce the carbon footprint of both food production and distribution. And I just put this very simply here, the video will take us into more specifics, um, but increasing the consumption of plant-based foods is a, is a core piece of this process, as well as reducing the consumption of animal source foods. And that's in terms of the production. I wanted to highlight the distribution too, because I think this is something that may get overlooked, especially by much of the population that has the ability to do something about choosing foods that have better distribution sources. But if you're able to source foods locally and seasonally, then you don't, um, the carbon footprint of that particular food is lesser because the transportation um, and the fuel that's involved with all of that is quite a bit less. And so production and distribution are part of our system, food systems that can have a big impact. And I'm going to mention it here as well, but for people who already eat mostly plant-based, um, I would ask that, you know, in terms of how you might be able to improve, it might be in really looking at where your food is coming from and trying to pick foods that are sourced more locally and seasonally, if you're not already doing so. Okay, and there will be more detail on this. The reason I will share the video is because uh, the video actually details the blueprint that the Lancet article um, describes as what they think is the blueprint or template for a healthy diet that include that will promote human health, but also allow for the sustainability that meets the Paris um, Climate Accord Agreement uh, guidelines, and also um, could help potentially sustain a growing population of the world in a sustainable way. Okay, so sorry, back to this. So we're gonna go down this, we're gonna look at the positive side. So this is the greenhouse gas reduction. So what, we're, what, what the article is suggesting here is that our food systems can actually reduce greenhouse gases within a limit that is sustainable. Um, additionally, there, there could be biodiversity gain. So the idea is that we could focus on producing healthy foods from biodiversity enhancing food system rather than a focus on increased quantity of food from increased volume of just a few crops. And this is uh, my, refers to my reference of monoculture, most of which are used for animal production. So, um, and I put a video in here just as like a little comic relief because I did end up riding my bike across Iowa. This was a number of years ago, but I have lived mostly more on the coast or I'm in the West now, but closer to the West Coast and I grew up on the East Coast. And um, I spent a considerable amount of time in Iowa and it was just a lesson in biodiversity or lack thereof. And so this is my contribution. Interstate 80, Iowa. Mississippi River. Davenport. Corn, 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 corn. What's that smell? Corn, corn, corn. Corn, 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 look a tree. Corn, 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 there's that smell again. Corn, 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 Missouri River. Okay. I couldn't resist. Um, but so when you do the ride, the rag ride, it's across Iowa, you dip your um, one of your bike tires in, in the Mississippi River, you ride across Iowa, and then you dip your bike tire in the, in the other river to finish. 
and you see a lot of corn along the way and soy by the way but the idea is that we're growing a lot of the same thing um, often even with less diversity within that actual crop at any one given time to um, promote efficiencies and volume and probably revenues along the way but it's not necessarily the most sustainable and a lot of that corn is being grown for animal feed okay back on task So additionally, in terms of land and water system use, you, we can manage it responsibly. The idea is to govern land and oceans in a strong and coordinated fashion. So the article suggests that we implement a zero expansion policy of new agricultural land into natural ecosystems and species rich forests. So basically they say that we're not going to um, we're not going to expand agricultural land into areas that are already natural ecosystems. We're going to use other strategies. We're going to consider restoring and reforesting degraded land. We'll manage fish, fish stocks responsibly and expand the global agriculture um, system sustainably. So we're talking about land and sea. Additionally, they uh, recommend appropriate use of nitrogen and phosphorus. So improving fertilizer and water use recycling phosphorus, implementing changes in, in crop and feed management and enhancing biodiversity. And those are fairly general, but there, there's a plan kind of for all of this and they're envisioning again, a food system that's going to, to have positive change in all of these different areas. In terms of food waste, the goal is to achieve a 50% reduction in food losses and waste. And this is also something that I think um, a lot of us can do, obviously in a food system, this is different, but on an individual level, I think you can, again, if you're already eating fairly sustainably, um, trying to achieve a reduction in food losses on just an individual scale is something you could possibly do, um, as well as if you're working, if you're living and or working, cooking for a family or for others, your effect can be amplified. Okay, so that was the first part of the talk. I wanted to provide some, some context and really for me, it was a way for me to get a sense for what we're talking about, what the context is. And I came away from getting some of that information, even if it may be somewhat superficial, just with the sense that there is a compelling need to consider healthy foods that are also healthy for the planet in order to preserve earth as we know it and preserve the quality of life here as we know it. Um, and so then the next question becomes, how exactly do we do that? And the video from the Gaples Institute is about 10 minutes. I'd like to share it. The first half does focus a bit on diet. I mean, not well, on um, health and diet but then it moves into more specifics in a very easily understandable way in terms of how we can achieve that very specifically with a diet and what that looks like, including more plant-based foods or all plant-based foods, but then how to incorporate, incorporate animal-based foods. And it's something that I think all of us can use in terms of weekly planning meals or even how you plan to eat on a daily basis for yourself as well as your family, as well as any other large or groups of people that you may be involved with on a personal or professional level. Mich Let me try it again. Stephen DeVries and long yep. Dr. Walter Willett, we Is would like working? to invite you to explore yeah. the important connection between a healthy plate and a healthy planet. We've dedicated this learning program to the memory of cardiologist and visionary, Dr. Bernie Lowne. You can click next or swipe to get started. And I'm going to click through this. I will have some comments here and there. And there are some interactions. If you've been thinking about how to keep your body in top shape, you already know that healthy food is good medicine. The research is clear that foods like vegetables, fruit, and healthy protein help give us longer and better lives. And a poor quality diet often leads to disease and early death. 
uh, there's something more you need to know, and it's just as critical to your health. The fact is, the same foods that are harming our health are just as harmful to our planet. Our food systems, the things we do to farm, transport, and package our food, are a leading cause of environmental changes. They're responsible for up to 30% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions and 70% of the fresh water we use. And so again, this information does come from the Lancet article, so that hopefully this now sounds more familiar. I do think 30% is significant. That's my reaction to it. 70% of fresh water use seems really significant too. But here's the good news. You have a powerful role in solving this. And in the next 10 minutes, you'll see how. Just imagine every day the decisions you make about what to eat determine what's on your plate for three meals. And that adds up to more than a thousand meals a year. Even if you make environmentally friendly choices for just some of those meals, you'll make an enormous impact on your own health and the health of the planet. And if you live with others and influence their food choices too, your impact can be even greater. For example, if you shop or cook for three other people in your household, your impact jumps to almost 4,400 meals every year. But why is it critical that we take a hard look at what we eat? Because the way our population is eating now is not sustainable. In fact, our current patterns have us on a fast track towards serious problems for both human and planetary health. Let's find out more. One very serious threat is obesity. Rates of obesity are surging and so are the health problems that go with it. You might be alarmed to find out the percentage of U.S. adults with obesity. Move the needle on the scale to see what it is. Obesity is not typically the issue for people with bronchiectasis and NTMLD, but I think we understand this is a global epidemic. And that number is a 40% increase from the prevalence of obesity just years ago. That states. The number of people with diabetes is also rising quickly. Worldwide, it's almost double what it was 30 years ago. In fact, half of all U.S. adults now have diabetes or prediabetes. Again, maybe not the threats primary threats facing people with NTMLD and bronchiectasis, although a lot of my patients are concerned about this, but it's worth mentioning that a lot of the people that we know, or the people that you may know, in your family or friend circle or acquaintance circle are dealing with this. And although the death rate from heart disease has been declining for many years, that decline is now leveling off. It has even stopped completely in people aged 45 to 64. All these problems are deadly. And the biggest contributor to early death is poor quality diet. So what will it take to fix this? The research tells us that people who eat more of the foods on the left and limit the foods on the right are far healthier than those who don't. In fact, Cultures where people historically ate this way have been known to live longer, healthier lives. So not a surprise that they're promoting a more plant-based and or Mediterranean-style dietary pattern. Eating more plants and fewer animal products improves health. And even small changes make a big difference. Watch what happens when people swap just 3% of their daily calories from meat to plant-sourced protein. Click each item to see the effect. So if we swap um, plant-sourced protein for unprocessed meat, there's a lower death rate. If you swap plant-based sourced protein um, 
for or replace <laughs> processed meat with plant-based source protein. That's a huge benefit, huge benefit for just a 3% swap. If you're eating around 2,000 calories a day, it would mean changing just 60 calories from meat to plants. If our population shifted to eating fewer animal products and more plants, we could save about 11 million adult deaths a year. That's almost a quarter of all premature deaths. And it's easy to get plenty of high quality protein from healthy plant sourced foods. Most adults need about 60 grams of protein a day, which you can easily get from foods like these. Click each one to see how quickly the protein adds up. So I like this slide. I'm going to stop here just a little bit, but they are suggesting that most people shift to a, a more plant-based diet, including getting more protein from plant-based sources. Um, and I routinely in clinic recommend people aim for 20 to 30 grams of high quality protein, which generally what I'm talking about there is more highly absorbed or highly bioavailable protein, which often comes from animal sources like dairy, eggs, chicken, fish, and meat. And so the recommendation here is, you know, can you try more plant-based sources and they are pointing out how to potentially get 60 grams of protein per day with a plant-based diet. So one cup of broccoli, three grams of protein. Um, I like the tofu here. <clears throat> a half a cup is not very much. And tofu is something that I like and I just would like to incorporate more into my diet. So this is a little bit of a push for me. Maybe you can find things that might be a push for you, but tofu has a significant amount. So if I had tofu, I would eat more than half a cup. I would probably eat closer to three quarters of a cup or a cup, and then we're at 15 to 20 grams of protein, which is good because you will be getting protein from other sources like your vegetables and potentially your grains. Here's quinoa. So if you added quinoa, what is this? This is sunflower seeds. But if you were to do brown rice, or say you did quinoa and you did a tofu stir fry or just tofu that you had seasoned, uh, the one of the time, probably my best experience with tofu was actually marinating it in a little bit of tamari and ginger and oil. Um, and then actually eating it raw, I tried to, but it didn't crisp up like tofu but it tasted good because it soaked up um, the seasoning. But that's a realistic way of getting um, the, uh, enough protein in a meal that you're close to the 20 grams or more, especially if you're doing more tofu. Um, if you look at legumes, because that's another way, and what they have on here are, I think, black beans. There's eight grams and a half a cup, and these are lentils. So a half a cup of cooked lentils might have nine grams. Um, but if you pair legumes with, again, grains, um, and you're probably going to need to eat more than half a cup, assuming you can digest that much. But let's say you got three quarters of a cup of beans. Um, that would be 12 grams plus a half a cup. But I, I think you're going to be eating more than a half a cup. Um, so let's say you're getting six or eight more grams. You're close to the 20 grams which is the guideline that I give people. You can also see, let's see, this is oatmeal. So this is potentially a breakfast grain. Um, a cup of oatmeal has about six grams. Um, this is whole grain bread. Two slices of a high fiber whole grain bread, this might be a little bit of a stretch, would have six to eight grams. Um, and then you'll also see that almonds in particular are one of the higher protein nuts. So an ounce, which might be 22 almonds has about six grams. And sunflower seeds, a quarter cup has about six grams. So I think what I would recommend you consider doing, um, and we'll see later that you can add uh, some amounts of animal source protein, including dairy, eggs, chicken, fish, and meat. But if you were trying to do this strictly with plant-based, then at breakfast, you're looking at some kind of whole grain. 
I would suggest putting nuts or nut butters there. Um, maybe in addition to the cereal, you have a piece of toast with some peanut butter or almond butter on it in order to get to the 20 grams. At lunch, maybe you could do legumes and uh, whole grains and some other vegetables to get to the 20 grams or more. At dinner, maybe you could do a tofu or other meat alternative with vegetables and whole grains to get to the um, 20 grams. So I think it's doable. And in my head, I'm trying to figure out how I would recommend people doing that and how I personally would also do it. Hopefully that was helpful for you. The same dietary changes that our population needs are the very changes that our planet needs. For example, a single serving of red meat generates 180 times more greenhouse gas than a serving of beans. Let's take a look at how other foods compare. Here are some foods you might have in your own kitchen right now. Slide the orange plate to the right to see how much greenhouse gas was generated to make one serving of each food. So I'll slide this. Keep in mind that this is just one way that our foods can have environmental impact is with climate change. Um, we go to legumes, very small, fruit, vegetables, nuts, chicken, eggs, fish, dairy, and red meat. All animal source foods have more than twice the harmful impact of plants. And red meat is off the charts. It's by far the most environmentally harmful of all. Cattle and some other animals like sheep and goats are especially problematic. Unlike humans, these animals can digest fiber into usable food. Their gut bacteria breaks down the fiber through a process called fermentation. But this action produces large amounts of methane, a gas with 56 times the global warming action of carbon dioxide. The methane enters our atmosphere mainly through burps. I didn't realize belching was the main way. I would have said toots too. People often wonder if grass-fed beef is better for the environment. Grass feeding often provides a better quality of life for the animals, and the meat produced is slightly healthier. But compared to conventional methods, grass-fed livestock offers no clear advantage when it comes to how much greenhouse gas is produced. Here's why. Grass-fed cattle grow more than lot animals. Longer to reach market weight, they end up producing more methane over a longer period of time. What about eating seafood instead of meat? Well, the environmental footprint of seafood varies a lot, and it's based on the species, the location, and how they're caught. For wild-caught seafood, the biggest causes of greenhouse gas emissions are the fuel used by fishing boats and the refrigeration needed to preserve the catch. For farmed seafood, the biggest impact comes from producing feed. Farmed aquatic animals are raised on fish meal, fish oil, and agricultural products like grains and soy. Click to open up this muscle and find out why certain shellfish can be a good choice. Bivalves are a type of shellfish with a hinged shell, like the mussels you see here. Bivalves are among the least harmful to the environment because they don't need feeding. Instead, they live on plankton that they filter from the water. Mussels are an especially good choice. They have a smaller environmental footprint than most fish, and they contain high levels of omega-3, a type of fat with important health benefits. Okay, so this was eye-opening for me. I often pick salmon as a choice for seafood um, because it's cheap, relatively speaking, cheaper than a lot of things. Um, I also pick rainbow trout, um, but 
I generally don't pick mussels or oysters for that matter, but I've started to as a choice, um, as they mentioned, since they're filter feeders, we don't need to provide um, feed for them. And um, I, I think oysters anyway are grown in like buckets in coastal areas. And so there's not as much fuel, I think that goes into the fishing piece. So this is an individual choice that I certainly will be making um, moving forward. With all the greenhouse gases our population is producing, too much heat is being trapped in our atmosphere and it's making the planet precariously hot. This map shows the number of high heat days that the U.S. currently has each year. Turn the thermostat dial to see what will happen in the future if we don't make significant changes now. So these are projections um, based on global warming. The red is the number of days uh, that are over 100 degrees, not a whole lot currently. The yellow is just uh, one to 10 days, and then there's the spectrum. So if we go to mid-century, you can see a lot more red and even more so. A hotter planet brings a host of health problems. Excessive heat can mean more heart attacks and deaths from heart and lung diseases. As regions get warmer, allergy seasons get longer and some infectious diseases can increase. Dangerous climate events like wildfires, heat waves, droughts, and floods become more frequent and extreme, and they can devastate entire communities and their economies. As temperatures rise, so do our sea levels. And when salt water seeps further into the land, there's less fresh water available for drinking and farming. We also lose coastal land which causes economic disruptions and climate refugees, people who are displaced when their homes are damaged or destroyed. We've seen a lot of important reasons to make changes. And we know that replacing animal products with healthy plant source foods is a powerful swap for both personal health and the planet's health. Next, let's learn specific guidelines that will help you to eat more healthfully and sustainably. Okay, here we go. The guidelines we're about to cover are based on the work of the Eat Lancet Commission, 37 leading scientists from 16 countries. They convened in 2019 to publish a scientific framework for healthy, sustainable eating. Their work is based on the best available evidence for optimal health. For people who are able, one excellent approach is a completely plant sourced diet. This way of eating not only protects the planet, it's also a great choice for human health. Here's what a healthy plant sourced menu could look like for a typical day. In all three meals, least fruit, and the other half can be a combination of nuts, whole grains, and legumes, like lentils or beans. Some people are just beginning to cut back on animal products, or they don't want to eliminate them completely. If that's you, you can still include modest amounts of animal source foods throughout the week. Let's cover some important considerations about how to do it. So I think this is where it gets interesting because for people who are older, 55 and older, higher protein may be beneficial to minimize lean body mass loss potentially even bone uh, density um, to, to preserve that. Anyone who um, has NTMLD or bronchiectasis, I routinely recommend higher protein diets. And I think it's reasonable to include animal source foods if you're willing to. So here are the guidelines from a sustainability perspective. If you decide to include animal source foods, here are the limits that the Eat Lancet Commission has identified. Up to two animal products a day total. That can include one serving of dairy each day, such as unsweetened yogurt or milk or cheese, and one serving a day of these options, but limiting red meat to one serving a week 
add up to two servings a week of seafood, poultry, and eggs. Next, let's see how these maximums would look in a simplified one-week menu. So these are the essential guidelines, and I will confess that I don't eat like eat in a way that li uh, uses these limits. My recommendations also don't um, provide these limits, but this is something to consider as you consider how much and whether you want to modify your diet. I will say that if you're going to pick dairy, I think a good choice are the higher protein uh, sources like a Greek yogurt, a plain or very lightly sweetened Greek yogurt. Um, and then on the animal side of things, um, I, I will just highlight that red meat includes both beef and pork and seafood. I generally uh, stir, lean towards the higher omega-3, lower mercury seafood. So in brief, that is salmon, it's rainbow trout, mussels, sardines, mackerel, and herring. Poultry, chicken, and turkey. Turkey is high in choline, um, which is actually hard to get if you start analyzing your diet. So a mix of both is good. And then we have eggs too. So let's see how they just laid it out for a menu. Explore the weekly maximums by clicking each animal sourced food at the bottom of your screen. Here's the dairy. Again, I would probably recommend Greek yogurt. Two eggs per week. Two servings of poultry per week. Two seafood. One red meat. At the end of this course, you can print or download an infographic of these healthy planetary guidelines. So what you see here are two sources of animal source protein per day, two servings. If you currently eat animal products often, it might be helpful to focus on taking small positive steps, especially if a drastic change seems difficult. For example, if you currently eat the US average of five servings of meat per week, it might feel more realistic to set a modest initial goal, such as three weekly servings, while ultimately working toward a goal of one or fewer servings a week. And maybe they mean red meat there. Even if you reduce animal products by a little, the payoff is significant. For example, reducing meat intake by just two servings a week saves the same amount of greenhouse gas generated by driving five miles. And if you cut just a little further to one serving a week, it's like reducing greenhouse gas production by the equivalent of more than a 10 mile drive. And the benefits are just as remarkable for our health. In one study, cutting red meat intake by more than half a serving a day lowered the risk of diabetes by 14%. And so I'm going to comment here. When I saw this, I thought what I should do is drive fewer miles, ultimately. Um, the car you drive, how you drive your vehicle does actually make a difference in terms of how much CO2 you emit. By taking the time to learn from this program, you've already made an important first step toward a healthier body and a healthier planet. To finish, let's learn three important actions you can begin taking right now. First, eat less meat. If you currently eat meat, a good start is to add at least one or two meatless days a week. And when you do have meat, think of it as a small side portion rather than the main feature of your meal. And most importantly, as best you can, Stick to the guidelines you learned earlier. You can download or print this infographic as a reminder. Second, be a trendsetter. Keep in mind that your circle of influence is unlike anyone else's, and you can use it to encourage others to make good choices. You can start with your household. Earlier we saw that shopping or cooking for yourself and three others means you're influencing nearly 4,400 meals a year. Your choices have a big
big impact on the people you live with. Your choices also affect your social sphere. A simple action like bringing a meat-free dish to a potluck or choosing a plant-forward restaurant when you go out with friends can encourage others to eat more healthfully. And don't forget your workplace. See if there are ways you can advocate for healthy plant-forward choices for the dining and vending options at your work. And lastly, please share this interactive guide with others. Together, we can save the planet one healthy plate at a time. Tell your family and friends of all ages to visit plateforplanet.org so they can learn how to do their part as well. On behalf of Dr. Walter Willett and myself, we congratulate you for taking the important step of learning how you can build a healthier plate, and in so doing, helping to assure a sustainable future for us all. Be sure to click next for more learning opportunities. The last slide has These references. resources will help you to further deepen your knowledge. Nutrition for Optimal Health, a course for the public by the Gables Institute, and the Nutrition Source website at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We wish you the very best on your learning and health journey. Okay. Let me see if I can go back to my presentation. Are we back? Hopefully. Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay. That took a little bit longer. Hopefully my commentary wasn't too annoying, but I'm but I think it was a very easy way to understand maybe what some of the goals are. Um, really what they're proposing is those limits with animal source foods. They're saying that those type, that type of a dietary pattern is not only healthy from a longevity standpoint, but again, could also potentially support a bargaining population um, by mid-century. Okay, so then on to the final slides in terms of just a brainstorm. I already talked a little bit about this, but in terms of breakfast, I think that might be the easiest one to do. And what I tried to do is just provide ideas for picking more plant-based meals. I do encourage people to consider including modest amounts of animal source protein, even if you're a veggie or a vegetarian, you know, if you're willing to do some fish um, or include dairy and eggs. But in terms of breakfast, um, high protein options would be a protein shake made with plant-based protein powder, fruits and nuts or nut butters, whole grain cereal with nuts or nut butters, if you know me, you know I'm an oatmeal evangelist. And so like a hot cereal, uh, like oatmeal with melted peanut butter in it or topped with pecans or walnuts is generally what I choose because it's healthy. I think it's yummy and it's cheap and it's easy. <laughs> um, so it meets my main criteria for food, <laughs> pleasure, but also um, uh, health. You could do a rice cake with nut butters you could pick a dairy-free milk or a dairy-free yogurt and add nuts or nut butters or granola, muffins, pancakes, waffles, and there are egg substitutes. So just egg is actually a direct substitute for say scrambled eggs. Um, it's not bad, I've tried it. It's not, but it's not bad either, especially if you add, mix in some vegetables um, and some seasonings like some herbs and spices. And then if you're baking, you can also do, there's a, a, quite a variety of egg substitutes for baking, but um, something that I recommend is the energy egg replacer, but there's also between um, using aquafaba, which is the uh, liquid in the can of a beans or using flaxseed. There's a lot of various egg substitutes to use. In terms of lunch, think legumes. So pair, and what I mean by legumes are beans, pair um, legumes with grains and greens. And so what I like to promote, because I think it's an easy leap for a lot of people that I counsel and for myself is to consider refried beans and or hummus or potentially soups. Um, but the refried beans, I think is, I think it's ingenious because it, it meets my criteria again, but you can make your own refried beans um, with a can of no salt added 
beans, saute up some onions with some garlic, um, put some cumin in there, whatever, spice, or whatever spices you might like, and then add the beans and mash it together. You can add some of the bean juice and it's honestly, it's delicious. You can make a Mexican bowl um, with say brown rice or rice and some vegetables with that and then throw on some toppings like guacamole. Um, you can also do a pizza with refried beans. So you can make your own pizza crust if you want. And I've done even, I've made my own cornmeal crust and then I put the refried beans on and then I put veggies on top of that. That's actually quite lovely. And then you get your salsa and your guacamole. Um, you could also do just pizzas with like um, pre-made crusts or tortillas or English muffins for that matter. Um, you can make quesadillas out of refried beans. You can do tacos, you can do tostados. So I think this is an easy, I think people forget about refried beans and you don't have to buy them in a can. Um, Hummus, I'm a huge fan of. This is a big staple in my diet. I do chickpea puree, which is kind of my cheap, quick, quick version of hummus. But you can also make hummus with grilled tahini. Do that with pita, do that with a salad. That's what I had for dinner when I got home after work. Um, you can also just do beans. Um, you can season the beans. And you know, I, people will put them on sweet potatoes or potatoes, like lentils on a, on a baked potato or black beans on a sweet potato, then you can add grains and you can put that over greens. Um, you can just do whole beans um, and season it like Greek oil, vinegar, lemon, um, herbs, maybe some olives and put that over, that's chickpeas over garbanzo beans over greens. And then you can of course do soup. I do black bean soup, I like lentil soup. Um, I like uh, white bean soup. And then you pair that with like a whole grain bread and then some veggies. So I generally try and get people to consider doing legumes for one day, uh, one meal a day, if possible. Increases your fiber intake, gets more of your plant-based proteins up, um, and hopefully you can digest it well enough um, to include that. And then for dinner, think of a meat alternative, potentially. Again, you can include some animal sources, but if you're trying to think of swaps to do, the first thing I put on here is a dish that I was inspired to think about after I watched the video. So Gadu Gadu is from Molly Katzen's, um, it's a vegetarian book, Moose, The Moosewood Kitchen. Um, so I went to school up in the New York area um, at Cornell and I went to the Moosewood restaurant a bunch and she had this fabulous dish. It's, it's vegetables that can also include tofu. And then she makes like a rich peanut sauce with it with ginger in it. And I like ginger so you can do a cashew sauce with ginger, you can do a peanut sauce with ginger and it's thick and it goes over the vegetables and it's delicious. So that's something I haven't made in a very long time, but after thinking about this, I thought maybe it's time to try that. Um, I personally would like to do more tofu, so I included it here, um, trying to figure out how to season it and also get the texture I want. You can do a stir fry over a grain. Um, seitan is a meat alternative. I think it's um, wheat based, but you can season it and make sandwiches out of it. Corn is something may maybe not many people know about or have thought about, but it's a myco protein um, and it's a meat alternative. And I've actually made the most wonderful pot pies with corn. It's like chicken. You can also marinate it and make kebabs um, out of it. So corn and vegetable kebabs. You can do veggie burgers. Typically those are legume based. Um, you could also do like Southwest dishes. I, I've made a Southwest lasagna or tacos with soy crumbles. I've also done it with tofu. They're essentially soy crumbles. Um, and you can do cauliflower as a meat alternative. So those are some of my ideas. Um, and this is just my closing slide. So as we're pondering how to eat, maybe we monkeys, <laughs> which are which do eat more plant, not that I know what monkeys really eat, but I, my understanding is they're more plant-based and then they have a little bit of meat, um, a modest amount of animal source protein mixed in. So that concludes my talk. I hope it was interesting um, for you and maybe thought provoking as well. Thank you very much. That was actually very interesting. I think it, it's um, a good opportunity for us to learn more about how to adapt our diets in a healthful way. Um, yes. Yes. I know that a lot of people are interested in plant-based diets now. So um, this is the time when you can drop questions into the Q&A if you have them. Um, now, now is your chance to ask questions about 
about this kind of diet and eating and how you might be able to adapt it for yourself. So I I realize there might not be a lot of questions, but I'm interested in people's comments too. Yeah. Um, Maybe Please things go ahead. That they know or things that they do um, to contribute if they're if people are willing. So if you have comments as well, you can drop that into the Q and A. So please, if you have any anything to share with the audience, um, you had mentioned corn. Is that is that the that's with the Q Q O U R U O R N right? Have you ever heard of that? I have actually. They make um, different. Um, substitutes they make like nuggets like little chicken nugget type things and other stuff yeah i have yeah and it's available like here in colorado um king supers carries it or like kroger just the the basic supermarket so it's fairly accessible and they're it's often on sale too so you can kind of stock up um, yeah yeah it's available at a lot of grocery stores i think what's that i think it's available at a lot of grocery stores yeah. very yeah. widely available so somebody's asking in the questions, have you had tofu kan, K-A-N? No, I haven't. I wonder what it is. Right. Hang on, I want to look that up. Okay. I'm interested in knowing why, they, why they're why they suggesting this. Maybe it's one of their favorites and we'd love to know more. Yeah, if you have any uh, further um, insights into it, it looks like it's a brand. Um, the Genghis of tofu kan. <laughs> It's a tofu con is made from entirely organic non-GMO soybeans. Um, okay, it, it looks like it's a, a brand of tofu. Okay. Hmm. Um, um, yeah, and so if it's non-GMO, it may be organic. Um, you know, my understanding, again, I'm not necessarily an expert though, but is that a lot of soy is GMO. So it's interesting that this is a non-GMO specific. Yeah. Um, somebody's asking um, your thoughts on the Impossible Burger. Oh yeah. Okay. So um, actually, I like what the Impossible Burger tastes like, um, and I think the upside is that it's a pretty tasty alternative to red meat. Um, that's my opinion. Uh, the downsides may be that it is a processed product. So you still are going to get quite a bit of sodium and um, and it's processed. And I you have to re- you have to kind of remember what's important. I tend to be a little bit more purist. I like whole foods. You know, I want to eat um, and tofu is probably processed too. But I want to eat like legumes. Maybe it's edamame or um, or regular beans or. I would say tofu might be less processed than the Impossible Burger, um, maybe by maybe by a little bit. Um, so I tend not to buy products like that because I find them to be processed and I find them to be very expensive. And I would rather rely on the whole food if at all possible. But in in the grand scheme of things, um, you know, and just as an sorry, as a kind of a thought experiment, you know, when you consider a processed food, you do have to consider that quite a bit has gone into the processing of it in terms of whether it's fuel or electricity or other or other um, energy resources have gone into that product more so than they would like a bowl of beans. Um, so it's just part of the calculation. Is it better than red meat? My guess is the answer is yes. So if it's relative, then it probably is a better choice in the sense that it's better than a red meat product or a burger uh, in its truest sense. I I have had the um, impossible burger and I have to say, if you're looking for something with like a similar um, texture that's to a hamburger, that's a really good alternative. It it actually, I, I, when I looked at it, I could not see the difference. It was quite remarkable. Um, somebody's commenting on the, uh, this, the same person who asked about the tofu con is saying it's a seasoned tofu made in tamari. It's made in Rochester, New York, and it's delicious. So. Oh, okay. um, what was what was the first comment? It's, it's the, it's a seasoned tofu, I guess in, in tam, it says made in tam, tamari, maybe in tamarind. I don't know. Um, it's, but it says it's made in tamari and it's, it's made in Rochester, New York. And she said it's delicious. Oh, that's great. Actually, that's a good point because um, 
I have a number of vegetarian friends and they have actually recommended not necessarily that brand, but other seasoned tofus that are that are already pre-packaged. So it's like you basically open it and you're ready to go. <laughs> and you can do a stir fry with it, for instance. Um, so thank you for the recommendation. Um, I, if it's tamarind, my, my experience with tamarind is that that has a bit of a bite. If it's tamari, that's a little bit different. Uh, she, said, she said tamari, so she was, it was okay, probably okay. tamari. Yeah, no, no, yeah, so it's pre-seasoned. So um, I think that's great. I think those are, again, minimally processed products and their convenience too. And so if you're looking for a quick way to do a stir fry or even just put tofu on a salad, um, it's e relatively easy. Yeah, that's good to know. We have a, a, a nice comment. It was really an eye opener to see and hear the effects of what we eat on the environment. It will definitely make me think about new ideas for eating. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the feedback. It's, it's you know, for me personally, I, it's sometimes it's easy just, well, I, my world is so much counseling and clinical that I forget about the other side of it sometimes. And I honestly haven't really engaged with it in a while. And so when you choose to engage, you have to choose to decide what's important to you and how much that's going to affect your food choices. And so engaging is actually, is hard because it, it means you have to make some choices. We have another comment. I use a lot of tempo with tamari, tamari sauce. It's best crumbled and added to salad or rice. So okay. there's another good recipe idea, everybody. Yeah, yeah, tempeh. So I forget what exactly that's based off of. Is that soy? That might be soy. Um, seitan, I think, is wheat-based. But yeah, tempeh would be another good one, meat alternative. Okay, good. Um, we have a question. Isn't it difficult to gain weight on a plant-based diet? So <laughs> in theory, it is. Although, I mean, I can't tell you how many, I have met the number of vegans who are quite heavy because they're eating a lot of junk foods. Um, unfortunately, but, but I, I think the answer is yes. Um, however, I think it takes more work to get more calories out of those foods, but certainly it is doable in the sense that if you can eat nuts and nut butters, those are just packed. Those are calorie and protein bombs. So you can really eat a lot more of nuts and nut butters to kind of compensate maybe from some of the lesser calories and some of the other foods you're eating. But you can also um, really work the fat angle, as I've talked about before, between being generous with the oils that you're using in your cooking or <clears throat> drizzling oil on your food. You know, I had a teriyaki chicken, <laughs> what I'm eating for lunch this week, and I, I put some toasted sesame oil on the rice, on the chicken and the broccoli because it just the, I overcooked the chicken, it's a little too dry. So I put some extra oil on there and um, it made it more moist. So if you can use more of the higher fat plant-based foods that includes the nuts and nut butters, but also avocados and these added oils um, and seeds, but additionally, then you can actually, you can get quite a bit of calories in a, in a small volume. It's just you have to be very mindful about doing that and kind of calculating some of this stuff in terms of a tablespoon of olive oil is about 120 calories. Um, I actually just ordered some nuts from Georgia. I'm a little bit picky like that. And my junior pecan halves, three tablespoons is 210 calories. And I just, it's stunning how much you can pack into a tablespoon of oil or a few tablespoons of nuts. So it can be done, it, it does require purpose and attention. Okay, um, another question. What, when you talk about eating hummus, how much is a good portion? Right, so I would say a half to three quarters of a cup. That's a lot okay. of hummus. Yeah, that is, that is a lot of hummus actually. Yeah, it's a lot of hummus. <laughs> Um, and somebody is asking, what do you think about taking turmeric oils and oregano oils? Oh, sorry, I missed uh, the beginning of the question. I think you cut out a little bit there. Oh, sure. So somebody's asking, what do you think about taking turmeric oils and oregano oils? Interesting. Um, 
I think they sound good, especially if you're making your own potentially and then using it fresh or, or, or storing it appropriately. But um, you're probably infusing that oil with some of the compounds that are beneficial in those herbs and spices. So I think it sounds good. I've never personally had turmeric oil. Oregano oil, I can imagine what that might be like because I've had other herb-based oils. I love rosemary oil. It's probably one of my favorite. Um, I've had garlic oils, mushroom-based oils. Um, I love lemon oil. Um, so I'm, I think they're great. So some of the infused oils, um, the flavor is incredible. And so that's one of, the, one of the reasons to use these in addition to the potential health benefits, but it just adds so much to some foods that admittedly can be a little more bland. So I think it's great. So, so the, the person's clarifying about taking these oils, what about taking them in vegetable capsules? So I guess taking them as supplements as opposed to cooking? Oh, got it. Um, yeah, I, it's a supplement question. So it overlaps yeah. into the realm of, you know, is it a safe supplement? So I, and I don't know that any of those have been tested, but, but in, in theory, they could potentially be beneficial if you're, if, if, the supplement has been manufactured in a, in a safe way. And I will also say, if you go to our YouTube channel, we did have a webinar on supplements. So you can, um, you can find out more uh, about supplements and how to research them. Um, somebody actually has made a note here that they had tried turmeric and oregano oil and both found that they aggravated their, their GERD. So that is that is something you have to be careful with. But I think with every well, with anything you're eating, and also with supplements, um, if you have GERD, that, that might also um, exacerbate it. And somebody else has commented about the hummus again. Hummus in salad dressing is a good way to add calories and protein to a salad. Oh, I yeah. like it. I like it. Plus, you know, that reminds me, you can do tahini and make a tahini dressing or any other kind of a seed. Um, or nut butter, potentially kind of like my peanut or cashew sauce idea. So yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. That is a great idea. Oh, well, we've had some wonderful just suggestions shared yeah. tonight. Yeah. Um, okay. I think we we don't have any more open questions right now. If anybody has any last minute questions or suggestions, now is the moment to drop them in. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. We really appreciate it. This was a great webinar. Um, we do have another webinar that will be coming up um, in a few weeks on Monday, April 25th at 7 p.m. We will have Devin Smith talking about caregiver stress in our emotional well-being webinar. So please make sure you join us for that. And Michelle, thank you again for joining us. Um, this was a wonderful presentation. I think everybody learned a great deal. Oh, hang on. Oh, somebody's asking, I missed the beginning of the webinar. Can I find it on YouTube? Yes, um, all of our webinars are recorded and they are usually posted about three weeks afterwards um, on our YouTube channel. And we, we will always put out an announcement when they are posted up. So thank you very much, everybody. Michelle, thank you again. This was, a, I think, a really good educational experience. And I, I think it's going to be, uh, oh, hang on. We have more questions. Nope, sorry, false alarm. <laughs> Um, what do you think of Kate Farms? I guess that's another brand. It is. So Kate Farms, in addition to Orgain, is a supplement, an or oral nutritional supplement, and they're plant-based, just like Orgain as well. Um, I do like Kate Farms because it is a plant-based formula, and it's an alternative to some of the well, animal-based, but also more pharmaceutical grade kind of supplements that a lot of people don't like because of the um, the additives, which can include things like corn syrup or um, other additives that seem less natural. Um, and the taste of the Kate Farm supplements are, um, I think they're, I think they're, I think they're good. And, and in a way they're also not offensive. So they're not overly sweet. And they don't have off flavors with it. It is pea protein based, Kate Farms is. So some people don't necessarily like the pea flavor. Some people also think it's still chalky. I personally don't think it is. Um, and I, I like them. I think they can be useful as a protein supplement. Um, 
I, they, they have high calorie supplements, the 1.5 formulas. They have a glucose control supplement. Um, that's a 1.2 formula. And what I mean by that is 1.2 or 1.5 calories per milliliter. Um, and the key there is, and what we talk to our patients about in, in clinic, um, largely because of the influence of Dr. Hewitt, is that when you are taking supplements, we do want you to take them with some food, particularly a grain or a starch that's going to anchor it in your stomach so that you, do, you have less movement of that fluid and you're less likely to aspirate it and then, or reflux and aspirate it into your lungs. Okay, um, we have another question and I think this might be more supplement related again. Um, is organic Moringa leaf powder good for you? And I, I'm, I believe Moringa leaf powder is more like a supplement. Yeah. Um, so um, again, I would recommend that you check out our webinar on, on supplements. Um, there's a lot of information in there on how to research supplements um, and determine, you know, whether it's good for you. I think I, I don't I don't really know a whole lot about moringa leaf in general. I don't I don't either. And so I don't know if it's a protein powder either. I think it more just be more moringa based. Um, yeah, I think I think it's not, I don't think it's a protein powder either, but I don't know. We get a lot of supplement questions still, so we may have to consider doing another webinar on supplements at right? some point. Yeah. Um, okay, so I've been asked, please send the YouTube channel name. It's youtube.com forward slash NTMIR. And I will drop that in the answer as well, but it's very easy to find. It's youtube.com forward slash NTMIR. And all of our webinars are up there. So please check those out. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to seeing you again. And Michelle, we will, we will be back with you in another couple of months with another great webinar on nutrition. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Have a good night.